Hi, good afternoon and welcome to the Innovation Experience Innovation Stories, uh, which are a series of three unique innovation presentations. I am Alison Emrine, the director of the VHA Innovators Network, and I am so excited to welcome you to the Innovation Stories. You will hear innovator experiences. These are frontline employee innovators participating in the VHA Innovators Network, or INET, as we refer to ourselves, um, Spark Seed Spread Innovation and Investment and Accelerator Program. They're going to tell you the story of their journey from employee to innovator. You will also hear and see some innovation demos, uh, a selection of last year's Breaking Boundaries Collaboration Challenge winners and Greenhouse Initiative um, and Innovation Specialist counterparts. They're going to give a live demonstration and talk about the progress of their collaborative innovations. And then finally, the Innovation Exhibitions, uh, the Office of Healthcare Information and Learning National Centers for Innovation to Impact staff will present the progress of their initiatives and programs. So we welcome you, settle in, and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Hi, I'm Donnelly Birch. I am the collaboration designer for INET, and I am the innovation specialist for the Sheridan VA Healthcare System, and I will be moderating the innovation stories for you today. First up, we have Robert Mooring, and he will be talking about his experience with improving healthcare access for veterans with a serious mental illness. Hi, Robert. Thank you. Hi, good morning or afternoon. Uh, thank you. For more than a year, I have struggled with the question, how do we keep our veterans who have a serious mental illness, SMI, such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, engaged in care? We know there's an increased risk associated with the SMI diagnoses and serious conditions like high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, increased risk for suicide. So routine care is important. This past July, that reality hit really hard. Within a matter of 26 days, I had two veterans who had been diagnosed with an SMI die by suicide. Why were these veterans not engaged in care? I didn't know. I don't know. When I started this process, I focused on a box five solution, created a clinical reminder that could be used to keep veterans engaged in care. But I realized that there were other possible innovative solutions that needed to be explored. Now look, I haven't abandoned my system redesign project. Rather, I've just added innovation through INET. Putting on my innovation innovation hat, I held multiple discussions with various stakeholders over the past year, and I identified a common thread. Excluding COVID issues, patient satisfaction was the number one reasons veterans stopped engaging in care with the VA. The most common comment, just didn't like my provider. These veterans were just unhappy with the provider, which got me to thinking, what can we do differently? That's when it dawned on me. You know, in the civilian world, you get to select your own provider. If you're like me, you look at the providers in your network, you make an informed choice of which provider meets your needs. Two years ago, community care with the VA gave me five surgeons to pick from. I got to pick the surgeon with the training, expertise, the experience, and the type of surgery that I needed. I had a choice. Veterans with an SMI diagnosis have more difficulty with trust, so having that ability to connect with the provider is fundamental to their recovery. They like having a choice. Imagine giving these vulnerable, at-risk veterans the same opportunity to make an informed choice in selecting their provider. Through the INET, using a human-centered design approach, we envision giving our, vision, our veterans a curated experience. A human-centered design was new to me, and it taught me a very important lesson. Without this opportunity, I would have spent all of my time looking at a computer system, trying to solve a problem, rather than just connecting with our veterans to find out what it was they wanted. Jumping into a box five solution would have caused me to miss the opportunity to connect with those veterans. Through this process, we developed what our veterans asked for. We're giving them the ability to make an informed choice about the provider they see, which aligns with the VA's veteran-centered approach to care. In the words of one veteran, it sends the message that I matter, and it gives me a greater sense of self-responsibility. Thank you.
Thank you, Robert. Can you tell me, what was your favorite thing about this experience? Well, you know, um, really just being able to talk with the stakeholders um, out there, um, which includes, you know, the primary care providers, the mental health providers, but really also include a lot of veterans. Um, because they are who we're here for. And so being able to talk with those veterans and understand really from their perspective what it was that they were looking for and what it was that was keeping them away from care um, and how we could change the way we do things in the VA to better align with their needs was probably the most in, um, enjoyable experience. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank you. Okay, next up, we will have our next experience, Kristen Mate, and she will be talking about VIC, the Veteran Integrated Chair Kiosk. Hi, Kristen. Hi, Kristen. Hi. Go ahead and share with us your experience. More times than I can count, I park in our <coughs> VA parking garage and assisted veterans or their caregivers with physically getting into the building. Our beautiful campus is made up of many buildings that are geographically spread out and most are not connected. One vivid memory I have involves a veteran walking slowly with a limp from the parking garage into our primary <coughs> care. When I approached him, I noticed he was breathing heavily. I looked to see if there was a stray wheelchair around, but I saw none. I asked if I could help him and he said he was okay. So instead, I walked with him for a bit. He would take slow, short steps, stopping frequently along the way. It didn't take long for me to see the look of defeat on his face, to which he then told me, I just can't walk any further. Thank goodness the other nurse was walking past in that moment and saw the concerned look on my face. There were no wheelchairs in sight, so she set off to find one. After what seemed like an eternity, she came back with her rolling desk chair because no matter where she looked, there were no wheelchairs to be found. This was embarrassing, unfortunate, and quite honestly, unacceptable. But it happens all the time. If staff can't find wheelchairs, how are our veterans and caregivers supposed to locate one when they need it? A few years ago, I traveled to Ireland and I had my first experience with an Aldi. When I approached the shopping cart corral, I was confused because I had never seen anything like it. Once I figured out what I needed to do to get the shopping cart, I thought we needed something like this for our wheelchair issue at our VA, some type of system to encourage everyone to return their wheelchairs. I filed this thoughts away for another day and enjoyed the rest of my trip. Last summer, while at one of our CBOX, I noticed an area filled with wheelchairs in all kinds of states. They were stuck together, some were on top of each other, more issues with wheelchairs, not being safely stored, being visibly soiled, and some were even missing parts but they were out for our veterans to use. It was here that all my experiences came together to form the idea of VIC, Veteran Integrated Chair Kiosk. VIC is a wheelchair kiosk that disinfects, catalogs, tracks, and stores wheelchairs for everyone's use while in the facility. The end user will check out a wheelchair using a form of ID and a phone number. The kiosk will release a wheelchair to that person. If the chair is not returned, we'll have the contact information to help us retrieve it. The kiosk will track wheelchairs using RFID, radio frequency identification, a technology already used throughout the VA system. VIC will be able to communicate to the warehouse when one goes missing or needs repair. The machine will achieve wheelchair disinfection by using UVC light technology. After partnering with Cal California Polytechnic University for the FY22 Spark Idea Accelerator Program, the first prototype was developed. We are on to our second iteration prototyping of VIC in a partnership with Richmond VA Design Lab as a seed investee for FY23. Soon we will begin testing VIC at Gulf Coast. My name is Kristen Nate. I'm an infection control nurse at Gulf Coast Veterans Healthcare System. And I am so excited to see what VIC can become for veteran care in the future. I'm excited too, Kristen. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I do have a question here for you. How has this changed your life going through this experience and this journey? Um, it has made me more comfortable approaching people, um, getting buy-in from different people when I have ideas, um, or just trying to get teammates on board, trying to facilitate that change or, you know, in whatever, um, in whatever I'm involved in. Um, it's made me more confident and uh, more knowledgeable about innovation and, and the different services too that VA has 
developed over the many years we've been here. And as well as all the networking, it's incredible. And the people that I've been able to meet, they're like-minded and they're so full of passion for making veteran care better. And I just love to be a part of it. That's so cool. Have you seen any changes with how you are at work through going through this experience? Uh, sure. I can definitely, I have no problems approaching people and saying, hey, have you thought about this? Or um, <clears throat> how are we doing this process and how can we make it better? So I feel like just my overall confidence in approaching people and being aware of their job and how it can help facilitate other uh, changes in the environment and the culture. Um, that's, that's all I could think of. <laughs> that's pretty amazing. Thank you so much, Kristen. Thank you. So up next, we will be hearing from Laura Klug and Cindy Peters, and they will be talking about vets train pets for patients. Hi, Laura. Hi, Cindy. Howdy, I'm Chris, not Laura, but hello. We're talking about white noise. Oh, my apologies, Chris. Yes, we have Chris Earls and the White Noise Project. My mistake. Um, how are you today, Chris? Howdy, I'm good, thank you. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and tell us all about your project? Sure, Cindy, you wanna start? Hey, um, shall I just start out with our Okay. okay, good afternoon. My name is Cindy Peters, and this is my colleague, Chris Earls, and we are the project leads for the White Noise Project. Our story is a simple one. We are on a mission to provide rest for veterans. Everyone knows hospitals struggle to let patients rest. Uh, with doors opening and closing, machines beeping, people speaking, carts rolling. No one knows this like the veterans themselves. They didn't have the comforts from home, and they just could not find the rest they needed to recover. And we could do something about it. We could provide some of the comforts from home while in the hospital. So we have implemented white noise machines that take the sound of their ceiling fan or their TV static and we brought it to the VA. We found a machine that has emphasis on quality sounds, hitting the correct decibels that was safe enough to be used in inpatient mental health settings and with a manufacturer that's dedicated to working here at the VA long term. During the pilot, one of the veterans on our unit was struggling to sleep and he was offered one of our specialty machines. The next morning, he shared with us that it was the first night of restful sleep he had had in days. The white noise evoked an incredible memory of being at his grandmother's and hearing the old furnace lulling him to sleep as a kid. It helped him feel safe and cared for to be able to hear a similar noise in the hospital. Veterans have been telling us stories like this for two years now, and we have data to back up these stories that surprised us completely and blew our expectations out of the water. In two years of research, we had 97% of veterans interviewed report positive satisfaction ratings. We analyzed their objective sleep hours, and we saw 20% of sleep hours gained from using white noise versus veterans that did not use white noise in the hospital setting. That's about an hour and a half more sleep just by using these machines. So the bottom line for us is that these machines are working, which is great because we've hit a lot of roadblocks along the way that knowing we're helping veterans this much has made these obstacles well worth it. Uh, finding a quality machine was no easy task. The VA red tape is, is a daunting task for any nurse working on a project. And the Innovations Network's biggest strength is a huge hurdle as well. It's so adaptable. There's no one set way to do anything. So navigating how to get things done with no bowling bumpers, so to speak, was a bit challenging. Uh, but we created every single SOP tool and guideline and data that we've got. Despite everything, we were up to the challenge and I'm really glad that our work has developed. So we continue to spread this project to other sites and we are seeking further support for the continued data collection so that every veteran in every VA hospital in America can get the sleep they deserve while away from home. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. 
Thank you, Cindy and Chris. That sounds very interesting. I know that I've had veterans in my life that have struggled with sleep in the past as well. And I didn't know that the White Noise uh, project was, even existed. So I'll be able to share that with them. What, can you tell us a little more about what that aha moment was that kind of led to you guys wanting to do this project? We just know our veterans were struggling, um, you know, anxiety uh, by being in an environment that's not familiar to home. And uh, after re we was on the research council and um, we discovered that the white noise could help with sleep and anxiety and it just kind of just kept building from there. So we had a we had like a, some civilian anecdotal uh, magazine that we had seen, but we we weren't sure if that was actually if it worked, if it worked in the hospital or anything like that. So we pitched the project to uh, collect data for that. That is really interesting. So other than sharing your story with us, Chris, what are you really excited for? I know you're here at the innovation experience. What are you excited to see in the next couple of days? So there are some mental health innovations. And as I work in mental health, I am very excited to see those panels. Um, and I'm excited for Shark Tank. <laughs> yeah, I am too. I'm looking forward to it. Well, thank you, Chris and Sandy, for sharing your experience with us. Um, have a great day. Thanks, thank you. you too. OK, guys, up next, we will have Laura Klug and her Vets Train Pets for Patients. This time, we're on the right one. Hi, Laura. Hi, how are you? I'm great. How are you doing? Good. Are you ready for me to get started? I sure am. Let's hear it. All right. So I'm Laura Klug. I'm the Cincinnati VA Medical Center Polytrauma Program Manager. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about my Spark Innovative Program. I've been working on it for about a little over the past year, and it's called Vets Train Pets for Patients. First, I wanna start with a story about my why. Why do I work at the VA? Why do I choose to serve veterans? And most importantly, why am I committed to making a difference? Last month, I was at a family dinner when someone asked my husband if he still kept in touch with his military buddies. His response was a couple, but most of them are no longer with us. As a combat veteran, he had some killed in action, but most others lost their lives from self-inflicted means. While his experiences are his own, his story is similar to many of the veterans I talked to in my polytrauma clinic. It's my husband's journey that has motivated me to continuously look for innovative ways in my clinical care to get veterans involved in meaningful activities and encourage healthy lifestyle choices since these tenants can be protective against self-harm. My program is, called, is, is a collaboration between the Cincinnati VA and a third party nonprofit organization called Pets for Patients. Pets for Patients has the special mission of rescuing shelter pets and connecting these pets with families of chronically ill children. Partnering with Pets for Patients gives veterans an opportunity to be part of the rescuing, fostering and training process. So when the animal is placed, it's ready to be the perfect family pet. Well, I don't think I need to convince many that caring for pets is good for the mind, body, and soul, I did need to convince several people within the VA to get the green light to proceed with this project. My progress was on hold for much of this past year, going back and forth with the Office of General Counsel, working through approval paths, hearing a lot of no's, hitting delays while the project was passed off to yet another attorney or another office. And after a lot of learning and continued persistence, it turns out my project didn't really fit any of the approval pathways I explored. With the support of local leadership and the VA Innovation Network, I moved forward with Vets Trains Pets for Patients as a special program offering. And while it would have been easy to say, you know what, I tried, it's just isn't gonna work, I kept pushing forward because of my why. In these pictures, I wanted to visually represent the benefits Vets Train Pets for Patients can provide. I also wanted you to see my why. I wanted you to see a veteran with chronic pain up and exercising, a veteran prone to isolation sitting with a companion, and a veteran socializing and spending quality outdoor time with his family. Ultimately, I wanted you to see the mental and physical benefits that fostering and training a dog has brought to this veteran and his family. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. 
this is great work that you're doing. I, it's so true that you have to know your why and the fact that you're helping others find their why too is truly inspiring. Thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. Thank you. Up next, we have Lisa Lombardo. She will be sharing her experience with clinical stimulation driven rowing program for veterans with paralysis. Hi, Lisa. Hi, good afternoon. How are Hi, you my doing? Name, I'm good. Great. All right, I'll get started. My name is Lisa Lombardo. I've been a physical therapist for over 20 years working with individuals with spinal cord injury. There are over 44,000 veterans living in the United States with spinal cord injury. Due to paralysis, it's extremely difficult to get good exercise. And because of this, two out of three people with spinal cord injury are overweight. As a physical therapist, I've always had a passion to help individuals with paralysis exercise. My journey began in 2021. I was awarded a seed investment and worked with a team of engineers to develop a smart rowing machine. This is an adapted rowing machine using electrical stimulation to allow individuals to exercise both their arms and legs. We started with a commercially available rowing machine. We developed a clinician-friendly app that automatically coordinates contractions of the paralyzed legs in combination with arm movements. In 2022, I was awarded a spread investment to further advance the rowing machine and spread the technology to the Minneapolis VA. We began 2022 by talking with veterans with spinal cord injury to determine what they needed and wanted out of exercise. We did trials of our current rowing machine with veterans to get their feedback. The underlying theme was that it needed to be easy to use, easy to set up, and they wanted to be able to do this independently. We met weekly with the clinicians and engineers from Minneapolis. We showed them what we've developed so far and discussed the problems we encountered with our participants. We identified the key issues to address where the backrest was not supportive enough and the veterans with paralysis were not able to maintain balance while seated in the rowing machine. We also discussed how we could incorporate trunk movements during rowing. In addition, we identified ways to improve the current app, including adding a coaching component to guide veterans on how to row properly. The team always analyzed the pros and cons of various solutions and made sure that these solutions were safe for veterans and easy to use for the clinicians. We ended up adding a back brace to the rowing machine that was adjustable to accommodate different levels of abilities and allow trunk movement. In August, I traveled to Minneapolis with one of our engineers and we did a two-day training with clinicians and engineers on how to use the rowing machine. As you can see in the video, we had the opportunity to try the system with several veterans and get their feedback. It was so rewarding to hear a veteran say, this is the best exercise I've gotten since my injury. This experience has really enhanced my leadership skills and how to organize a team of people to work together. We're, we're continuing to work with the Minneapolis VA to get veteran and clinician feedback and hope to continue um, furthering the development and collaborations on future projects. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Lisa, for sharing that experience. It's really exciting to hear what's going on and I really look forward to the finished completed proje project. Thank you. Up next, we'll have Carolyn Ehring and her low vision tele-eye rehabilitation experience. Thank you so much for allowing me to break through all the barriers I have faced for the past 10 years to have a voice today for partially sighted and legally blind veterans. I'm Carolyn Erig, a low vision optometrist and service chief at the VA in Buffalo, New York. It will make sense to all of you that veterans who live in rural areas face challenges to accessing all forms of health care. To begin my story, you need to imagine that you set up this great low vision rehab clinic at the Buffalo VA in 2008 and all partially sighted and legally blind veterans need to travel up to 200 plus miles to you round trip so you can help them adjust to their vision loss to prevent depression and help them remain safe and independent. The sad reality for our veterans who cannot see well generally cannot drive to Buffalo and they were going without our VA low vision care. I began to think outside the box in 2011 because I had tele equipment. 
I modified my evaluation and our hospital let me set up our hub and spoke low vision telehealth service so more low vision veterans could receive low vision rehabilitation care. I was so thrilled when it worked in 2012 and I continued to enjoy hearing how happy our partially sighted and legally blind veterans are when they receive our telehealth care because they tell me they did not know what they were missing. So if Western New York has partially sighted and legally blind veterans who cannot travel to a low vision specialty clinic, then obviously there are several more veterans in every other state across our country who are also going without VA low vision specialty services and telehealth can be the solution for other VA low vision specialty clinics. But who knew? By increasing access to our partially sighted veterans by using telehealth for the past 10 years, would still face barriers to helping more low vision teams. I tried other national programs, but it wasn't until I applied through the Innovation Network and Go Fish that gave me the opportunity to help more veterans using telehealth. Although frustrated at times, I never gave up. And I'm grateful for this past year as the Innovation Network enabled me to work with the low vision rehabilitation team at the VAs in Des Moines, Iowa and Minneapolis, Minnesota to set up and spread low vision telehealth services. My goal now is to work on establishing a national funding source to continue to help other low vision optometry teams set up telehealth services because several veterans risk continuing to be denied help adjusting to their vision loss to prevent depression and risk being denied help to remain safe and independent. So my best advice is don't give up. It's worth our extra time and effort for our veterans. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. That was very interesting. I'm wondering, how has this experience or your journey through this experience affected your life at work? I'm busier <laughs> and I'm learning how to, to juggle more and, and actually delegate my time of when I can help other teams versus still running my clinic. Um, and it's, it's challenging at times, but we, it's a learning process along the way, which just helps other teams as I help them to show how I've been able to provide this service within a busy schedule. What would you say to other clinicians that are thinking of an innovation idea um, that are saying, I'm so busy, I'm a clinician, I have patient care. What would be some advice? They, they need to just t put the time in to apply because if you are accepted, the opportunity for you to be able to help more uh, with your innovation is truly rewarding. And if you don't put the time in now to try to be accepted, um, you'll never know. But it really, it's, it's very rewarding, all the extra time you put in. Um, and, and I wish you luck, whoever continues on their journey. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Have a great day. Thanks, you too. Bye. Okay, up next we have Alicia Hurst and she will be talking about quiet conversations anywhere. Hi, Alicia. Hi, good afternoon. All right, so should I just begin? Yes, please tell us about oh. your experience. Uh, hello, IEX. Uh, my experience is that one day I was sitting in my office trying not to hear the conversation my coworker was having. They are in the office next to mine. Then it dawned on me, COVID isn't going to last forever. How am I gonna hear veterans if they visit me in my office? How are we gonna be able to focus on what we are saying and not the noise around us? And what about the lucky people who share offices or are in cubicles? The noisy workspace issue is huge. Wouldn't it be amazing if it wasn't, if like Y2K, it just quietly faded off into the distance? As a fiscal year 2022 innovation series participant, I was determined to start solving this issue. And part of that work was gathering data to inform the design of my prototype. However, very surprisingly to me, I underestimated what was in store for me. The experience of being in the innovation program was absolutely life-changing. I thought I'd learn a little bit about the innovation process, and a little bit about sound and technology, which I did, but it was the stories of other people's experiences with the issue that really touched my heart. For instance, after hearing my pitch, several people immediately told me the struggle is real 
because they share one office with other people and have the hardest time focusing and hearing their patients because they can hear their coworkers on calls who are right next to them. They made me realize that's the gold of this program. The prototype isn't just a solution to a problem. It's solid proof that people's voices are being heard. Recently, I was accepted to continue this work and knowing that our prototype works and has the capability of benefiting a huge amount of people, I am even more passionate and driven to see this project through to the end and have this widespread everyday issue solved for good. For any of you who have an idea and aren't sure if it's worth exploring the Spark Seed Spread Innovation Program, I am talking directly to you. Go for it. Even if you don't create a prototype that works, you are closer to solving the issue than you would be without even trying. And that's a win for everyone, including the people you don't yet realize your innovation could help. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Alicia. I think we all can relate to having that noisy coworker and trying to get our work done despite the noise <laughs> pollution in our area, right? So tell me, what are your next steps in, in this process for you? So this year I'm gonna be focusing on um, really fine tuning the prototype and see what works for people and what doesn't, the design of it. Right, gotcha. Well, thank you for sharing with us today. Thank you. Up next, we will have Kevin Johnson and he will be talking about his kyphotic wedge. Hi, Kevin. Hey, how are you? Great, how are you doing today? doing well. Why don't you go ahead and tell us about your wedge? Sure. <laughs> Sound <laughs> funny. All right. Uh, so anyways, my name's Kevin Johnson. I'm an MRI tech at the Cincinnati VA. And for 17 years, I have been dealing with patients who have a difficult time lying flat for the MRI and even more have a hard time sitting up. Now, this is typically due to a condition known as kyphosis, which is a curvature in the spine that causes the patient to have that hunched over appearance. Now this makes it difficult to perform certain imaging exams. So we have to, in order to handle this problem, we have to grab multiple people, lift the patient up in the air, shove pillows under their butt with hopes that that will lay them flat enough to perform their exam. The issue with that is the technologist can injure their back or even worse, we can injure the patient. So one day as I'm walking around the halls of the VA, I see a poster on the wall and it says, do you have an idea that can better serve the veterans? And my eyes just got really big, I was like, yeah. I got this idea on how to deal with the kyphotic patients. It's called the kyphotic wedge. So I present this idea to the innovation network and they liked it enough to where they gave me a little bit of funding to build a rough prototype. Uh, and by rough, I meant I bought a piece of wood and laid it, I laid it on top of the, uh, the MRI table and I got on top of it and I pretended I was kyphotic and I had my coworkers lift the board up in the air. And from the little information I was able to gather from that, it seemed like it was gonna work, but we would need a better prototype. So thanks to my innovation specialist, I was able to team up with the Minnesota VA and their adaptive design and engineering program. And they were able to build a more professional prototype. The cool thing about this prototype is that it used air compression and an inflatable wedge. Um, so I wasn't really able to try, I was not able to try it on patients. We just did not have that approval. So I had to uh, test it on my coworkers. And once again, from the little information I gathered, it appeared that it was gonna work. But then I got to thinking, instead of just tilting the patient backwards, why don't we sit them up too? Like I mentioned before, a lot of our patients cannot sit up on their own. So I got on Zoom and I uh, reached out to Minnesota and I said, hey, can you make this thing inflate the other way? And they go, yeah, not a problem. So they sent that device to me. And the good thing about this prototype is they figured out a way to plug it into the medical air and the vacuum that's already supplied for you in your MRI suite. So that's kind of where we currently are. Um, we're trying to license this to two different companies out in Europe. Uh, one's in Switzerland, the other one's in Belgium. Um, and eventually the idea is to obviously license this in America. Going forward, what we're gonna try to do is demonstrate this at a couple of VAs around the country. And uh, you know, I just can't wait to see how this all ends. It's been a wonderful process. I have nothing but good things to say about the Innovation Network and my Innovation Specialist. And uh, I look forward to uh, seeing how this thing ends. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kevin. I found I was able to see Kevin's uh, kyphotic wedge today, and it's very interesting. I even saw a couple of people comment about how they thought it would even help them with their bad backs. 
So I hope that you will be able to share this across VAs because I think it's a great invention that you have come up with. Um, so what has been your favorite thing about this journey of building this wedge? Uh, it's, been, it's been really great just seeing my idea come to life. Um, on top of that though, just the meeting all the new people and being able to do all this traveling with this device and telling the story, it's just been, it's been a lot of fun. Well, your energy sure shows through. Thank you so much for sharing that with us today. Lily, take care. You too. Up next, we have Daniela Estes, and she will be talking about her infection precaution door barrier. Hi, Daniela. Hello. Hi, everybody. <laughs> My name is Daniela Estes, and I work at um, Central Arkansas Veterans Healthcare System. I'm a quality management nurse. And about a year and a half ago, I got an email that stated that um, I had an idea I should apply to the Spark Seed Spread Program. And I thought, well, I've got an idea, so I'm going to give this a try. Um, I applied um, and was accepted as a Spark investee uh, with my um, a prototype for an infection precaution door bar. I help remind people to wear the proper PPE. It physically stops you from going into the room without um, your PPE. Um, so my journey started there. I went to virtual um, kickoff week. I went to the virtual boot camp. Um, and I'll tell you, I felt a little overwhelmed. Like, what did I get myself into? But I trusted the process. And as um, I went through the program, I got to collaborate with Aspen Labs. And um, they have great resources, great tools, a wealth of knowledge, and a, and a good networking system. So I felt pretty comfortable. And by July, I would say of last year, we had a prototype. Um, I was amazed to see it um, come from paper to a real product but, um, from the 3D printer. I got to collaborate with my um, innovation specialist. Medical media helped us with the signage, but my favorite part was getting it into the hands of the employees and all the uh, wonderful feedback, but also suggestions for things I had not thought about. So we took those feedback and um, we made some changes and now we have a good working prototype. Um, we're excited to start this seed cycle and get our prototype out there and start um, getting some data and interacting with staff. Um, and I just want to thank Innovations as well. They gave us a great uh, graduation ceremony. Uh, leadership came and supported. And so I've really enjoyed my journey um, with Innovations. And I would just encourage anyone, if you've got an idea, just to reach out and go for it. Um, and um, I just thank you guys for your time and letting me present today. Thank you, Daniela. So if I had told you three years ago that you would be sharing your innovation story on a national conference at Innovation Experience, what would you have said? I would have, I would have thought you were joking. I, I would have been like, there's no way that I could do something like that. Um, and, and so uh, without all the resources and everything that were provided to me, I wouldn't be here today. But yes, I, I wouldn't have believed you three years ago. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing your experience with us. Thank you so much. So up next, we have our last live innovation experience, and that'll be Adelina Sowell and her Employee Wellbeing Center and Carts. Hi, Adelina. Oh, looks like we lost Adelina. So it looks like we lost Adelina for a minute. So I just want to share with you my experience so far in the Innovation Experience um, Conference here. Uh, all of these people that are presenting and sharing their stories and demonstrations with you today have been sharing their products here at the Innovation Experience. And it has been really great walking around and seeing the different innovations, the different inspirations, and just the passion that the people have. So as many of our 
people have shared with you today. If you're a VA employee just wondering, how can I make this better, or I think that we could do this better, take it to your innovation specialist. Tell them your problem. Tell them that you might have an idea to help to solve that problem and just see what you can do when you collaborate with other like-minded people as yourself or just to have a passion to make lives better for our veterans. It's really worth reaching out and taking the time to suss out that problem and that maybe that idea that you have. Like Daniela had said, she never believed she would have been able to do it until she reached out and started getting all these resources and support. It can be such an experience. Pretty soon, it looks like we're going to go into our innovation demos. Um, and as Allison had mentioned earlier, this is uh, from Breaking Boundaries Collaboration Challenge winners from last year and part of the Greenhouse Project. Oh, looks like we're going to take a small break and we'll come back to you. Welcome back and thank you for your patience. As with any live stream, we had a little bit of a technical hiccup, but now we are going to jump right in with Adelina Sowell and her Employee Wellbeing Center and CARTS. Hi, Adelina. Hi, how are you? Great. So this is exactly the kind of moments that the Employee Wellbeing Center and CARTS were designed for, those little stressful moments. So do you hear it? This is the sound of employees who truly feel valued and appreciated by their leaders. I found that I'm able to refocus and provide better care to our veterans after a few minutes in the Wellbeing Center. I've discussed it with my van pool coworkers and even staff in the elevators. Perhaps I should make a t-shirt, I Heart VA Wellbeing Centers. Thank you so much for the opportunity to breathe. And here's another comment. This is the best thing that the VA has done in 18 years. Thank you for providing this much needed space for us. It's something very special. When COVID-19 first swept across the world, life just seemed upside down. And every day we went to work determined to make a difference, but we were tired, stressed, and terrified of bringing the virus home to our families. We saw patients recover, but we also lost patients and loved ones. COVID-19 introduced the new stressors to the already high level of burnout that we experienced in healthcare and exacerbated these issues. If I could say that there was any positive outcome during it all is that the very real need for focusing on employee wellness took center stage. Empowered by our leadership, voluntary service, partnered with the whole health team to come up with a solution for employee burnout at the onset of COVID-19. And I thought, what if the sky was the limit? And what if anything was possible? We were swimming in uncharted waters. We worked together with the Orlando nursing team on what features a calm and relaxing space would truly look like to meet their self-care needs. So picture a room with soft ambient lighting, glowing battery operated candles, and heated massage chairs wait for you while the sounds and sense of the ocean surround you. The nurses were the first to use it during National Nurses Week and the Employee Wellbeing Centers and CARTS were born. Just two short months later, we were told that the room would have to be shut down after the team had worked so hard to put it together. But our medical center director came to the rescue and gave the approval to create a permanent space in Orlando and also spread it across corporate Orlando. So the next logical step was to apply for the INET Spark Seed Spread Investment, and we were thrilled to be accepted, and we successfully spread the project to five sites of care that were committed to employee wellness. It's been an incredible journey that has sparked the innovation bug in me and the whole CDCE team. It's impossible to participate in INET and not be changed. So you look at every problem and every opportunity through a different lens, and you find joy in collaborating with others. Our hope is that this program will become a VHA best practice and continue to spread. But personally, it has empowered me to think outside the box, utilize the voice of the veteran, and to never let no stop me from pursuing a solution. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Adelina. I would certainly love for that to spread across the VA because that sounded so relaxing just listening to you explain what your um, room was like. Um, it, took me away to the ocean for just a few minutes. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Up next, we're gonna go into our innovation demos and we will have Jayesh Singh and Matthew Knight sharing ABLE Innovations. Hi, Jay. 
Hi, how are you doing? Great, how are you? I'm doing well, I'm ready to go. We are ready to hear all about your demo. Fantastic. Hello everyone, it is a true honor. Uh, by the way, I just wanna make sure that my slide is up on the screen. Uh, this just crashed again. Okay. Sorry, I'll, I'll go when the slide is up, if that's okay. I'll, I'll go when the slide is up, but, if that's okay. No, we're, we're just having a moment of technical difficulty. We're just having a moment of technical difficulty. Good way, Jay. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Good way, Jay. It, Thank it you is so a much. true honor to be presenting to you. My name is Jay, and I'm the founder and CEO of Able Innovations. My story began when I was quite young and I was volunteering at long-term care facilities where my mom used to work. While there, I witnessed her perform the backbreaking task of there, transfers and injure herself. She was moving a patient between a bed and a wheelchair and she dislocated her shoulder. Transfers refer to the backbreaking task of lifting and moving immobile individuals between surfaces, be it beds, wheelchairs, or stretchers. And it is a massive cause for injuries to our frontline staff, and it requires a lot of labor. It requires between two to eight staff to be present. Now, I'm an engineer specializing in robotics, and I had a vision to develop technology that automates this highly labor-intensive task. As you can see on the video down below, as you can see, our technology works at the push of a button. If it's possible to play the video, that'd be great. On the bottom right corner. There you go. At the push of a button, a compact conveyor belt type platform extends out and compresses the surface one is on and safely rolls underneath the patient without pulling or pushing on the skin or tissue. It's actually a very comfortable experience for the patient. And most importantly, it is safe and dignified. It also reduces staff dependency on others most while also protecting them from injury. Also as mentioned, my technical background positioned me to bring this innovation to a stage where we could demonstrate how it works. However, it is imperative that technology is practical and easy to use, especially However, in healthcare settings. I was on a quest to seek such frontline feedback when I reached out to Matthew Knight in early 2021, and that's when I heard about the amazing INET Greenhouse Initiative. Sorry, here. Immediately after meeting Jay and his team for the first time, I saw the potential impact this project could have for VA staff. Transferring patients has always been a difficult challenge in healthcare settings, and it was more pronounced with the staffing challenges we were seeing during the early days of COVID. Once the project started, we received a lot of interest from staff at multiple sites across the VA. Despite us having to arrange several meetings to accommodate clinical schedules, staff kept showing up and sharing their insights and expertise. The fact that VA team members were willing to take time for busy day during the health altered is a testament to the scale of the problem that they were facing. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, we were very fortunate to have Matthew as our innovation specialist, who's extremely passionate about the problem that we are solving. Together, we enrolled seven leading INET sites, including Heinz, Reno, Orlando, Richmond, and Palo Alto. We embarked on a high cadence of meetings every two weeks that allowed us to obtain feedback specific to all the user interfaces from nurses, potential users, and key opinion leaders. As an example of the areas that we collaborated on, they include everything such as the user panel, including the buttons, the screen, the patient side guards, nothing was off the, ta off the table. We got fantastic feedback. And as you can see, the image of our technology on the left was before we started the collaboration. And on the right is after we've collaborated the feedback. And we've added significant updates, such as adding remotes, improved handles, and many more changes. We also had the chance to visit Matthew in Chicago before the summer to really understand the scale of the problem and the impact of our innovation. We took the summer to integrate all these learnings and changing changes and develop fresh prototypes that we were ready to showcase. Our collaboration culminated in a week-long site visit to the Orlando VA Medical Center. Over the course of five working days, over 150 staff members from a variety of disciplines and clinical areas provided their thoughts on the updated prototype to Jay and his team. The feedback affirmed that the changes made to the initial prototype resulted in a more user-friendly product, 
staff were genuinely excited about the solution and they were hopeful that someday the Alta platform can help, trans can help transform the process of transferring patients. Bringing the Alta to Orlando was eye-opening and our technology's transformative impact was highlighted, especially during the demonstration. We went into the program with certain assumptions, which were definitely challenged. And as a result, our company and technology have definitely involved. The iNet experience was truly unique, and I believe that it helped us evolve our technology in a highly aligned manner that transformed us as a company. One thing that stands out to me and let me know that we're on the right track is when a nurse told us, I don't need four people to transfer a 350 pound patient anymore. Your technology will make a nurse's day. Now we are extremely excited and privileged to continue to break boundaries with your help. And thank you to the fantastic team, including Matthew Knight, Kim Bilecki and Allison Amarine for enabling such a successful collaboration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jay and Matt. I love hearing about these greenhouse initiative projects that come in. Up next, we have another greenhouse initiative project being shared by Jessica Smith Beaver and Elizabeth Williams from Veronetics. Hi, Jessica. Hi, Liz. Hi. Hi, Dolly. Why don't you go ahead and tell us about your medication dispenser? Thanks, Donnelly. Well, hi, I'm Jessica Beaver, the Chief Regulatory Officer with Veronetics. And I'm Elizabeth Williams, Innovation Specialist at the Gulf Coast Veterans Healthcare System. Veronetics is a small startup company focused on building integrated technology solutions to support efficient and secure distribution of medicines. Our first product is called Dispensacure. It is designed to support patients with opioid use disorder or OUD, specifically those receiving liquid methadone that would normally be administered daily from a clinic. As you might imagine, daily visits to a clinic became quite a challenge during the COVID pandemic. It was clear to us that some individuals could potentially have interruptions in care as well as access to their medication. So this prompted us to design a specific solution using our technology. As part of our product design process, our company was searching for feedback on our solution when we found out about the INET greenhouse collaboration opportunity. We knew that the veteran population is affected by OUD at a higher rate as compared to the general population and veterans are at an increased risk of controlled substance abuse, misuse, and addiction. So we thought the VA would be a great partner to gather feedback on our product. We never could have imagined the beautiful journey we experienced through our collaboration. So off we went and did what we do best. We began using human-centered design to provide feedback to Veronetics on the Dispense Secure system. The Gulf Coast, Edward J. Hines, Memphis, San Francisco and Western North Carolina VA healthcare systems provided multiple virtual and in-person user experience feedback sessions with both clinicians and veterans. The clinicians varied from physicians and psychologists, psychiatrists, pharmacists, social workers, peer support specialists, nurses, and many, many more. Later, we helped facilitate immersive in-person sessions with veterans who were both in inpatient as well as outpatient local recovery programs. The feedback provided by VA clinicians and veterans proved to be invaluable. So going into this collaboration, our company was focused on our original application for use, a secure and controlled way to administer methadone away from the clinic. Based on what we heard, we quickly realized that everyone we talked with recognized that Dispense Secure could serve as a tool to build trust between patients and their caregivers in the recovery journey. What we didn't anticipate was the enormous value the collaboration would yield to drive future directions for our company. By using human-centered design, a common message began to emerge. We heard that a product built to help more patients access medication to manage their OUD could also serve to prevent other individuals from ending up in the same situation. One veteran in active recovery was brutally honest with us. If he really wanted the drugs inside, he could break into that box. But the more we talked and he started to reflect, he told us about his experiences returning from Afghanistan, 
with injuries that required numerous surgeries and how he was prescribed pain medication that he eventually developed an abusive relationship with. He then said, I wish I had something like this. This could have helped limit my access to the medication and maybe I wouldn't be where I am today. We also heard from a surgeon who expressed to us that when she prescribes opioids for post-operative pain, she is so fearful that she could contribute to a future opioid use disorder. She told us how there's just no good data or no real good way to measure post-op opioid medication use to really know what providers should be prescribing. Hearing her express the dreaded guilt that she endures as just part of doing her job was unforgettable. These are just two examples of the accounts we heard. We have known for a long time there has to be a better way, and our collaboration with INET exposed previously unarticulated needs of veterans and clinicians. Because of that, we are now working with renewed energy on breakthrough approaches to better manage prescribed controlled substances, as well as to provide a mechanism of gathering data on medication use that will inform both safer drug handling practices and more data-driven prescribing and dispensing protocols. Finally, a new case for our technology we simply hadn't considered before was inspired by our conversations. We envision using a new version of Dispensacure to enhance lethal means safety and help reduce veteran suicide by the intertwined benefits of limiting access to potentially fatal medications, linking patients to the veterans crisis line and their providers to important predictors of suicidality. We are on a mission because it matters and because there are lives to save and to change. I thank you for your time and attention. Jessica, and thank you, Liz, for sharing um, the great work that you have done on this Greenhouse Initiative with Dispense Secure. And I'm looking forward to working with you some more in the future. Thank you so much, Donnelly. Up next, we will go into our innovation exhibitions. And up first will be Leanne Schlamm and Devin Harrison, and they will be talking about their simulation-based healthcare design, testing, and digital twin technology applications. Hi, Devin. Hi, Leanne. Hello, and thank you. So the story behind, uh, first of all, the similar assessment collaboration and outreach team, we identified as portfolio digital twin technology. The portfolio provides system hospital activation post-construction in pre-construction simulation-based healthcare design testing. Both include multiple service lines and interprofessional teams. Use simulation to proactively assess space to identify latent safety hazards and patient care improvement opportunities in workflow, patient flow, equipment and emergency procedures prior to the first patient care day. Then we provide to leadership a patient care improvement matrix that is um, includes recommendations for remediation and mitigation strategies based on those like the safety threats, which can result in significant costs or delay the opening of these vitally needed services. Just to give an example, over the last few years of uh, with the post um, hospital activation, some findings door widths have been too narrow for a bariatric wheelchair or bed to go through. And if you can imagine that, along with another example, uh, a drain where an eyewash station was that did not include a basin where water would go on the floor, causing a slipping hazard to both caregivers, frontline staff, and veterans. Finally, another example um, of being pull cords when tested for emergency buttons that are not working or displaying inaccurate location. As you can see, that is a large concern. So we asked ourselves, how could we test this before the first shovel of dirt? And that led into the simulation-based healthcare design testing, which brings together clinicians and architects from the Office of Construction Facilities Management to discuss the blueprint and patient care space 
and we provide a patient room mock-up to scale based on the design standards. However, there are limitations of um, how much we can build and adjacencies of a mock-up, which led us to think further outside of the box and innovate. Devin? So we decided to create the digital twin application with the help of the Office of Construction and Facilities Management and the Veteran Experience Office. And the digital twin application allows us to take a 2D rendering or a 2D, a 2D paper schematic and create a 3D rendering of it. And it, the application itself has three distinct features. It allows you to design, it allows you to simulate, but it also allows you to immerse in a virtual environment. The design portion of that application allows you to customize your space based on how you see it. So let's say you wanna see how adjacencies are affected, or you wanna have multiple exam rooms that are larger than what the normal footprint for an exam room could be. You can go ahead and create set those attributes within the system and it will create a model for you. Once that model is created, now you can run scenarios through them. So if you wanna see how Wait times are affected based on how you designed your space or you want to see how mass casualty uh, events are affected within the space you design, or you just want to see how your traffic patterns flow within the space. Um, you'll be able to do that as well. But what it all, but one of the, the bigger features of it is letting the user know what a space is intended to look like before construction is completed or even before design is done. So now users have the capability of using an AR, excuse me, a VR headset and putting that on and fully immersing themselves within the space and be able to navigate and walk through the space, move furniture around, take measurements of the space while they're immersed in it virtually, just so that they can get a feel for what is to come. And the purpose of us doing this is to, you know, strengthen collaboration uh, between users on the clinical side or the technical side. But we also want to give people a better understanding of what they're getting into before construction is done and change orders are involved. Leanne? Thank you, Devin. And with that, we've seen an increased confidence in staff. And we've also brought in the veteran experience office so that we can have insight from the veteran. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne and De Devin. I really like this idea of actually simulating the environment that you're building. It really gives a hands-on approach for everybody involved. Um, I appreciate you bringing this forward and sharing it with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, we have Dr. Tom Osborne and David Arella for sensor-enabled wearables for fall prevention. Hi, Tom. Hi, David. Hey, thanks. Uh, great to be here. I think David might still be in the green room. If you want to help him out, that'd be awesome. So, Tom, uh, while we wait for David to come and join us, why don't you tell me a little bit about what was your aha moment with what you're about to share with us? Was there something in particular that uh, made you go towards this direction with your uh, sensor enable wearable? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, we'll talk about that a little bit in a few minutes, but it's a great question. Uh, and really, I think falls is a major issue that's relatively underrecognized. And, you know, our team is really focused on solving problems that people need or want addressed. And that seemed to be something that was really important in general for the, you know, for the country, because it's a very common issue, but also for, particularly for a veteran population who are more at risk for falls than anybody, uh, any other healthcare system, because we tend to have patients that are older and have more comorbidities, which predisposes you to falls. And, you know, another thing, I mean, once you oftentimes, unfortunately, once you fall, there's um, a lot of other bad things that happen. And if you can avoid that, then not only is it better for patient wellness and care, but it's also better for uh, the providers, which we have limited numbers of, and for the cost as well. I mean, we can do a lot more things with the huge amount of money we spend on things that are preventable. 
That is so true. Falls can lead to such things as hip fractures that can shorten a life quickly. And um, I just appreciate you answering this question off the cuff for us. It looks like we, David has joined us. So I will let you guys go ahead and present your innovation exhibition. All right, cool. Thanks so much. So first of all, it's fantastic to be here and share some of the work we're doing. Uh, first, some acknowledgments. I mean, in addition to the great work and support that we have from all the people that everyone knows in the innovation ecosystem, it's it's really awesome uh, to have the great support that we have at our facility. And in particular, uh, Director Lisa Howard and Chief of Staff Mike Kozel have been a tremendous support for all the work we're doing, and uh, we couldn't do it without them. So uh, let's see. I think this is an old slide, but we'll use that. That's okay. So um, basically, slide this slide we're supposed to see is slides is, is a, a huge issue. And we talked about this just briefly a minute ago. Uh, you know, major a leading cause of severe injury, disability, and death uh, throughout the world. And you know, according to uh, WHO and CDC, in the U.S., a couple of years ago, many years ago, actually, I think it was 2017, that falls cost 50 billion dollars a year in the U.S. I mean, that's a huge number. I had no idea, but uh, it really just underscores the scale and the important personal cost that falls have. Uh, so another, another problem with this, I think, unfortunately, is rates are increasing despite a really extensive efforts that many people have taken to prevent falls. So in our typical fashion, we got together and uh, we found and we looked for ways that we can improve this issue. And we rallied with our clinical leaders and experts. So we went around and we asked questions, lots of questions to our facility colleagues in the wards, and we listened. And importantly, um, we collaborated to find an out-of-the-box solution, something that hadn't been done before to meet their needs and uh, something that could also be configured for their workflows, you know, to, so it works for them and not sort of imposed upon them. So we worked really closely together. They drove the clinical side and we did our best to, to make the clinical side jive with the technical side, which is obviously a challenge in of itself. We also worked with uh, some other great leaders like Angela Gant Curtis from OIT, who uh, you know, really uh, allowed us to break down some barriers as well throughout this and many other projects. And we found a solution. We found a solution that we thought might work and a solution that a lot of other people passed up on, which is interesting in of itself. So this solution has a lot of advanced features. It's sensor enabled, it's wearable, it's cloud-based, it's intelligent. And so maybe that's a, a bit much or intimidating. I'm not sure if that's why, but we decided it looked like uh, it was worth a try and we went for it. And importantly, the solution looked like it was solving those problems that we had identified with our collaborators that needed to be addressed. And so the journey began and we started to navigate all the permissions and authorizations and regulatory guidelines and everything else. And yeah, this is something else. But fortunately, we have an amazing team member, David Ariola, who just joined us, who has done an absolutely fantastic job with this. And next, David's going to provide a snapshot of a few of those items that he plowed through. Go ahead, David. Thank you very much, Tom. I really appreciate that. My name is David Ariola. I'm the Tech Integration Analyst for our Innovation Center, NCCHI. Uh, if we can move forward a couple slides, please. I wanted to go ahead and discuss um, maybe two more slides there. Oh, sorry, that's it. Perfect. We go back one more. We're right there. Perfect. Uh, so I wanted to highlight some of the uh, background work, the foundational work that's required to bring in new technology into the VA. As many of you might know, the VA is uh, quite a bureaucratic place. A lot of approvals need to be obtained to bring in new technologies. And if, uh, if I might say, sometimes it could be a barrier for many to bring in these technologies. So I wanted to highlight the work that we did uh, in order to allow for our project to be successful, but also help enable the project to be scalable across the VA. Now, there's a number of, of approvals required depending on the type of technology. Our fall prevention system is what I would call a hybrid uh, system. We have both cloud components and on-premise components that have to work together. In order to implement the system, we obtain what I like to refer to as the holy trinity of approvals within the VA. Um, I say that lightly, there's a number of approvals you really need to obtain depending on the project, but for this particular one, it covered all our bases. Uh, for the cloud component, we had what's referred to as the authority to operate, also the ATO. The purpose of that approval 
was to allow the cloud application to be utilized within the VA environment. To help simplify some of the security concerns, we were able to implement, again, with the uh, partnership of people like Angela Gant-Curtis and the CTO office and others in the innovation ecosystem, uh, place the server within the VA enterprise cloud. Next, we have what's referred to as the Memorandum of Understanding and Interconnection Security Agreements, MOU and ISA. This enabled a site-to-site -site VPN connection to be established between the VA and our vendor uh, for remote support and maintenance of the systems. That goes makes really helps uh, relieve some of the burden from our IT embalmment departments uh, as the vendor takes on the burden of, of uh, maintenance. And last, we have our enterprise risk assessment, also known as the ERA. That authorizes the local uh, devices and server to be connected directly to the VA network. The combination of all three uh, approvals is paramount to being able to implement the system successfully and securely and allowing other VAs to take our work and apply it to their system or their healthcare environment. So I'm very proud to say that as we speak, we have a number of other VAs currently adopting this technology. With that being said, I'm gonna hand it back to Dr. Osborne so you can go into more detail about how our system is being used. Thanks, David, appreciate it. Uh, again, David has done a fantastic job with this and so many other projects in collaboration with our facility and across the VA. It's, uh, it's a lot of work to get to this point and it's people like him and everyone else on our team that make it happen. So, okay, so the cool stuff. Next slide, please. Perfect, all right, so this will be the last slide, I think. So this is how the solution works. So we're gonna look from the slides from your uh, left to the right. And so in some ways, the big picture, the solution kind of works like an advanced bed alarm with additional features. And the big picture goal is to alert staff when a fall risk patient gets out of bed unaccompanied when they shouldn't. So, you know, that's cool, but how does it do that? So to increase the sensitivity and specificity, basically the performance, uh, the alert is only triggered when different sensors on the SOC are activated, such as pressure sensors and positional sensors and an accelerometer. And then once that information happens in the right sequence, the information is wirelessly transmitted to an in-room tablet that then sends the information to our VA enterprise cloud for rapid processing. And when the right parameters are identified in that system, then the three nearest nurses to the patient are alerted that the safety uh, badge, through the safety badge that they're wearing, that there has been a fall alert. And that badge is pretty cool. That's the, the middle picture. It's about the size of a regular ID badge. And it also tells you the exact room number that the patient's in. So only the three nearest nurses, not everybody, and it tells you exactly where to go. So the thing buzzes, it displays the room number. And so we, the, the clinicians, in this case, often the nurses, know we identify the right people and they know the right place to go at the right time. So as soon as the nurse enters the room, which you'll see in that last picture there, the whole system uh, goes on an automatic disability, disabled. And so uh, the system is turned off. So you don't have to worry about the alarm going off while you're taking care of the patient. So all this is really designed and configured to make life as easy as possible for our really busy nurses and clinicians who are, are have a lot of work going on. Okay, so once we got that system together, then we started to analyze the data that we have. And we've been using the system for over, over a year. And our objective analysis was really compelling. And what we've shown, and which is currently in peer review in a big journal, is we've shown significant reduction in falls. And as David said, we are now in our next phase of a broad collaboration and with others across the VA and including our innovation ecosystem, we are now helping many other healthcare systems leverage this technology to extend the broad positive impact to improve the lives of our veterans, which is what we love to do. That's our presentation. Thank you so much, David and Tom. That is very interesting and something I can definitely get behind. Fall prevention is very important. Up next, we have one more innovation exhibition. We will get the pleasure of seeing Dr. Tom Osborne again with his cohort, Zachary Vagelis, and they will be talking about translational COVID analytics. Hi, Zach. Hi again, Dr. Tom. <laughs> hey there. <laughs> Fantastic. Is Zach in the room? Just want to make sure. There he is. 
All right, we got Zach on board. All right, so we'll do the same thing. We're going to play a little ping pong back and forth. Again, fantastic to be able to, again, share some of the diverse translational work that we're doing. And again, I just want to acknowledge some great people. Uh, obviously, we get great support from those that you know in innovation ecosystem, but also wanted to highlight our innovation team, as well as our amazing executive staff at Palo Alto, Director Lisa Howard, and, and Chief of Staff Michael Kozel. Awesome people. All right, next slide, please. All right, so we're going to be talking about COVID. Uh, we, like many others on our, you know, have been driving a diversity of COVID projects. And our focus has been deploying solutions and uncovering insights that have a direct positive impact on patient care. One way we've been doing this is by leveraging existing resources in new ways. Uh, for this specific example that we're going to talk about now, uh, we're going to have to first go back a few steps before the pandemic started. And at that point, our team was uncovering ways to utilize our existing electronic health record data to inform us about who are the best candidates for elective surgeries so we can provide the best care for the best people at the right time. A lot of that work and diligence, uh, were, it took a long time to try to figure that out, and, but we discovered it could be done. And our published work came out right around the time COVID hit. So as you remember, the early pre-vaccination days of COVID was a pretty scary and uncertain time. And, you know, among other things, it was difficult to know who was going to need advanced care and who was safe to go home. And we couldn't admit everyone to be on the safe side. Uh, there wasn't enough hospital beds. But we also didn't want to send someone home who could suddenly need advanced care. So wouldn't it be great to have a crystal ball to sort of understand better how to best triage these patients. And so we thought, hey, we did this with surgery. Maybe we could utilize the same methods and tools to COVID. And so our amazing lead data scientist you can hear from shortly, Zach, and some of our other team members, such as David, myself, and some local clinical analytics colleagues jumped in. And as it turns out, it could be done. Our VA data-informed predictive models could predict the likelihood of COVID admission, long admission, acute care admission, and long acute care admission as well as intubation. And so, wow, this is amazing. So at this point, I was like, how is this thing doing it so well? You know, we had all these variables and so wanted to dig deeper to better understand the details, which could really give us great insights. But before, I'm gonna let you hang on that a little bit. Before we dig into that story, Zach is gonna provide some insight into how he does his magic. Go ahead, Zach. Thanks, Tom. Um, great tee up. So uh, to build on what Tom uh, introduced us with uh, here, so um, the VA is the largest integrated healthcare system in the United States, as we know. And so we were uniquely positioned to take on this challenge. Um, the data collected at every VA um, and the electronic medical records, so patient data, um, all ends up in one place. And so in the VA, we call that the corporate data warehouse. And you know, that gives the VA a treasure trove of real patient data that can be tapped to solve um, some of healthcare's greatest challenges. Um, you know, as far as the health healthcare sector goes, um, this is pretty unique and a rare commodity. Um, so typically, you know, healthcare systems are, you know, regionally um, based and, uh, um, you know, really they don't have, um, they enroll a fraction of the patients that the VA does. Um, so with something like COVID, uh, we needed a lot of data, um, you know, the, in order to make these insights. Um, so at any rate, the VA has what we call, you know, real big data in healthcare, which is, like I said, a rare commodity. Um, so early on in the COVID-19 pand COVID pandemic, uh, the VA had already generated a significant amount of data, um, surely due to its size. Um, and, you know, the VA, as we know, spans across the country and, and beyond. And this made us well positioned to take on this work and really gave us a responsibility to our veterans, um, and even bigger than that, society as a whole, um, as all of us were affected by the pandemic. Um, and so for this work specifically, advanced analytics is our foundation. Um, so what we do is we combine, you know, clinical expertise and, you know, thanks to, thanks to Dr. Osborne for his diverse uh, and broad, deep experience in healthcare, um, his clinical expertise, um, patient data, cutting edge tools such as cloud computing um, and in modern statistical approaches like machine learning um, to solve these types of problems. 
And so the result of those, that kind of intersection of all those things is discovering patterns and trends um, to inform, in our case, healthcare that were not previously known or not um, you know, completely obvious, obvious to the naked eye. Um, so as Tom mentioned, you know, we first set out to assess patient risk. And you know, we asked ourselves, can we identify patients that were most susceptible to poor outcomes due to COVID-19? And we thought we could. Um, so using one of the greatest resources that we have at the VA, uh, which is our treasure trove of data, once again, we could assess which patient characteristics make an individual most vulnerable to a poor outcome, like ICU admission or ventilation or mortality, using things we know about a patient, such as comorbidities, medications, demographic information, social determinants, and things like that. So the reason why assessing risk is so important is that we could use the information gained to intervene potentially and prevent a patient from you know, accelerating to a poor outcome. Um, we took all this information that we, once again, the characteristics about these patients, variables, um, and we applied machine learning algorithms to help us discover patterns that were predictive in these poor outcomes. And you know, the results of our models were very compelling and had great success at assessing veterans for risk of poor outcomes. Additionally, our results uncovered other patient characteristics that were critically important to lowering a patient's risk, which we didn't actually plan for, um, but we were pleasantly surprised when those popped up. Um, so one of those variables was aspirin. Um, and mm -hmm. I'll let Tom kind of talk more about aspirin and the clinical, the clinical impact of aspirin. Um, but as we know, aspirin is a well-known uh, medication that is typically prescribed for patients with high, rest, high risk of cardiovascular disease. And so our work to, to, uh, related to risk of poor outcomes is really only part of the story. Um, as the pandemic raged on, our database was filling up with very important information that we could con continue to leverage. And once again, not just uh, provide insights for our veterans, um, which is our number one priority, but potentially help um, you know, society as a whole once again um, you know, glean insights that, that were not apparent early on. So um, we uh, set out to discover if certain populations of our veteran community were disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Um, we suspected that social determinants of health, or SDOH for short, could further inform our efforts, efforts to mitigate risk of individuals um, for a COVID diagnosis. And due to the geographic and demographically diverse nature of our patient population, we were once again well positioned to inform the broader healthcare and public health community on patients that are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And overall here, we had you know, a, a very broad and deep portfolio related to our COVID analytics work, um, but this would, these discoveries would not have been possible without using this real world patient data combined with our analytics and clinical expertise um, to uncover these insights. So I'm gonna kick it back to Tom to kind of uh, talk a little bit more about our body of work and the clinical impact of some of our findings. Perfect, thanks Zach. Oh, so back to our story of serendipity. Uh, Zach alluded to the serendipity. We were looking for one thing and we found another. So we wanted to know how this predictive model worked. You know, what were the patient factors that were most important? And could there potentially be a modifiable factor that might improve care? That was a big question. We could really, we could really do something important if we knew that. So we dug in. Zach added some more variables as he talked about. And we did lots of variables without any preconceived biases about what was important. We put it all in there. Uh, and then he used some fancy machine learning models and logistic regression. We spent lots of long hours working on this. And then one late uh, night, Zach called me and he's like, hey, Tom, you're not going to believe this. And I was like, after I heard what he said, I was like, yeah, you're right. I don't believe this. And so the data and analysis, this is early in the pandemic, uh, showed that pre-COVID aspirin use was associated with a significant reduction in mortality. We don't know why, we don't know the association, but hey, this is a, this is a major signal. And so now at this time in the pandemic, 
it was like, what, what is aspirin doing? Because we like, it was a bad pneumonia. That's what everyone just knew and understood about COVID. What on earth could aspirin do for a pneumonia? So we had no idea. So I knew one of two things was either happening. Either the data was telling us something we didn't know yet, you know, and this big database allows us to figure stuff out like that, or yells at us and says, hey, pay attention, or something was wrong with the data and the analysis. And we needed to figure that out. It was a really important, big responsibility to get this right before we shared this unexpected news with everybody else. So I called another colleague who was a data scientist and he's like, yep, checks out. I said, oh, geez. Then another colleague who was also a statistician. Again, all correct. Then another friend, I was like, I'm gonna be totally sure about this because it's such a big deal. No one's gonna believe it. Another friend who is a fellow investigator uh, working independently to find medications to could help COVID patients. His response, we put it through our, our code and it confirms your results. And he's like, you guys found it, like shaking his head, smiling. So around that time we completed the work, there was a small autopsy report from another institution that found a high incidence of blood clots in COVID patients. Hmm, that's interesting. And soon after, it was also becoming apparent that COVID elicited a strong inflammatory response. So it started to make sense why aspirin could help. Now, although this is this first study was just a correlation study, in other words, there's an association, not a causation, it, it, it uncovered a new and an unexpected insight. And this association was strong and it led to many other investigators to do studies designed to understand the uh, potential appropriate role uh, and use of aspirin in COVID care, which is ongoing. So that story is unfolding as we speak, but there's a lot of work and it came out of our amazing health record. So as Zach was saying, a lot of other stuff happened in parallel. Uh, since those initial COVID investigations, we've had the opportunity to do lots of other important insights, pull stuff out of our EHR record to advance care. And if you go to the next slide, uh, the next slide will show you some of our published work. Uh, these are all peer-reviewed publications that have come out of our EHR and a lot of diligent analytics. And uh, so as we move forward from those initial things that we talked about, we have done more and more things. Additional national investigators we've collaborated with across the country, and more recently with some BD Step fellows, and even others in our audience, such as Amanda Purnell, has jumped in. And so I'm going to end the talk. I know I've been talking a bit. So in summary, I think the important part of this story is it illustrates how thoughtful and diligent approach informed through collaboration, through clinicians and analysis and all kinds of people, experts, can uncover important value from existing resources such as our EHR database. Thank you very much. Wow. Amazing work. Thank you, Tom and Zach, for sharing that with us. It's very interesting. I was hanging on the edge of my seat, waiting for every detail you just shared with us. I appreciate you sharing that with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very kind. It was my pleasure. Up next, uh, we're going to share a short video with you from a lady who was not able to be with us today. So she went ahead and recorded a video for us, and it will be our last innovation experience today. It is from Michelle Reagan, and it's about one question. Hi, I'm Michelle Regan, and I'm the R my day job is that I'm the RN Transition to Practice Program Director at the Orlando VA. As part of the program, I always ask new nurses, what did you learn in nursing school about veterans? And their response is always, PTSD, be careful, you're going to get hurt. Between that and going to a virtual funeral with one of my friends who on display was a picture of her fiance who had passed from suicide in a uniform, I said, oh, I didn't know that he, that he served in the military. And she said, yeah, he never really wanted to talk about it. And then my husband who served 31 years in the Air Force never believed that he was eligible for care through the VA until I started working here. His belief was that you had to have a missing arm, a missing leg, or some embedded shrapnel to receive care. Care. So those three things, and then reading an article during one of our classes, there was a link that went to a already VA established QR code that had a, um, a questionnaire for community providers to be able to guide a veteran when they identified a veteran 
by asking one question, have you ever served in the military, that they could have this, this questionnaire to be able to guide a conversation with a veteran to um, see if they were, um, if they would be eligible to receive care or what services we had. So we had this QR code, we started brainstorming, um, went to the innovation specialist, knew that there was a shark tank from the support of our leadership and upper leadership. They, they thought it was a great idea. So we have this QR code and we started brainstorming and we thought about business cards and we thought, oh, how much would it cost to redo to business cards and distribute them and whatever. So that was very costly. And then we came up with what tool does every nurse use and love and sometimes we steal is a pen. And so we were looking at how we could incorporate this pen onto this QR code onto a pen. And I was sitting at dinner table with my family and my daughter was like, they have banner pins that you can just pull it out and you can put anything you want on these on these pens. And I was like, oh, genius. We'll put the QR code on the pen. Um, we have an affiliation with five different nursing schools within the, our community. We put the QR code on the pen, researched it, what would be the best color. It was red, my favorite color. So that worked out great. And we took this pen with the QR code, met with, we've met already with over 200 nursing students, dispensed over 200 pens, asked the nurses to incorporate into their practice one question, have you ever served in the military when they come across someone in the community, hoping that we will be able to serve those veterans who so deserve the, the care. We're here to serve them and we want them to understand that we're here for them. So go, moving forward, we're hoping to um, spread this further into our community and potentially uh, throughout Visionate within the next year. And that is all we have for you today for our innovation stories. So join us tomorrow. Um, we will have Kelsey Scholl moderating our innovation stories from 2 to 4 tomorrow at IEX. We'll see you there.